Hey everyone, Mr. Wineland here, um, as we are gonna go over uh, this new presentation of chapter, well, chapter eight, section four. I was about to say chapter four, but it's actually chapter eight, section four, but we're gonna go over it and talk about it. Um, we're gonna talk about the dawn of the mass culture. And what we're seeing is, what, what I mean by mass culture is popular culture. Um, it, it hasn't been coined that just yet, but what you're seeing is the masses, the people, is what we're talking about. And and what we're talking about is the people being able to absorb this in their life and make it a part of their life and make it pop culture. It kind of starts out in New York. We talked about Brooklyn kind of being the the hit spot in New York um, with the Brooklyn uh, area. It kind of, I wouldn't guess you'd call it a suburb, but it's in, in, in part of New York City and it became a place, a popular place to raise your children. Um, whereas Manhattan was a place to work. Um, but we saw the Brooklyn Bridge be built. But along the Brooklyn seashore where the, you know, all the beaches were um, just miles from Manhattan, they had a new amusement center called Coney Island. In 1886, you see tens of thousands of visitors are just swarming to Coney Island, a place where you, you can enjoy just amazing food and you're by the sea and there's some there's like carnival games and things like that, to, just entertainment out the wazoo. And so Coney Island offered Americans a few hours of escape time after a hard work week. You could just, you know, take the family and, you know, just go spend some money, um, cheap entertainment, and just have some fun. And this was right around the end of the 19th century. We start to see the rise of mass culture. And um, so you see what, what's really happening is you're also seeing the growth of the middle class America. Um, because at one point in time, like we had talked about the days of Andrew Carnegie, Rockefeller, um, it, it felt like you had those with money and those who didn't. Um, you didn't have much of a middle, a middle class. Um, and so we're starting to see the middle class slowly shine here and that people are starting to move up in the world and kind of be able to uh, gain a few extra bucks here and there be, based on their job and their situation. Um, we're seeing because... Um, more and more people are getting a hold of money and cash in their pockets is that this is opening up leisure activities and opportunities for people to spend money and especially on entertainment value. So as the 19th century drew uh, to a close, you're seeing uh, the city congestion, dull industrial work by enjoying amusement parks, by signaling new forms of theater, spectacular sports or spectator sports. So what you're seeing a lot in this time as I'm kind of fixing some things. Uh, as you're seeing during this time, you are, you're starting to see um, new forms of entertainment be formed. Uh, one of those was the amusement park. Um, so one of the recreational needs you see in as city dwellers um, within Chicago, New York City and other cities, they wanted more places, more green spots, more outdoor destinations to enjoy. So some amusement parks were constructed on the outskirts of cities where there was more land, um, less buildings. And you started to see that this was an opportunity for trolley car companies to kind of take advantage of this and go, oh, well, people really like to ride the trolley, but what if we made it a little bit more thrilling, more fun? And we start to see that innovation happen where we start to turn the these type of trolley type rides and turn them in more into thrill rides, exciting rides. So we see the roller coaster uh, drew uh, Daredevil customers to Coney Island in 1884. And uh, the first Ferris wheel drew enthusiastic crowds in World's Columbian Exposition in Chicago in 1893, where you could create some fun and excitement, play things that are unique and different and new and and really draw people in and, and figure out what, what really ticks, what makes them really want to just enjoy and, and have fun. So a lot of Americans were ready to just kind of enjoy these new innovations of entertainment and a lot of it is being available. So with the huge, um, we start to see bicycling as being a, a big part um, in society as well. At first, bicycles weren't very popular because they're, they're huge front wheels and solid rubber wheels. So there wasn't a lot of, you know, cushion. Uh, so the first American bicycles challenged the riders. There's a lot of bumpiness with the cyclists. Um, some were going over the hand, handlebars based on the design of the bicycle. Um, it, it was really a male only sport because really a lot of men were able to handle the bikes better than that of females. 
Um, in 1885, you start seeing manufacturers, manufacturers start to really create what is called the safety bicycle, making the wheels a little bit smaller, adding air to the tires to make them lighter, fluffier, softer, um, which brings a little bit more spring into the movement. And so the, the activity is there for everyone to enjoy, not just men. Um, everyone is strong enough to handle the bicycle. And so this kind of brings a little bit um, – brings a little bit more excitement uh to um to the uh to the bicycle as i kind of fix my notes here ooh, ooh. uh but we start to see fifty thousand men and women uh start to take up cycles uh by 1888 and then two years later 312 american firms turn out uh 10 million bikes a year so you're starting to see um that people are enjoying this uh this new form of sport um, so we start to see other sports come about. Tennis is one of them that was uh, made popular um, as well. Um, it came from North Wales, which is in, you know, Great Britain. Um, Wales is um, kind of, I mean, I, I guess you could say it's, it's a district slash country of Great Britain. It's, it's, it's complicated with Great Britain. I, I have to tell you more about it, but um, it another time. But in 1873, tennis is coming about. Um, you have the grass uh, court, and it's very popular. And a year later, we see the United States picks up its first tennis match. And so we see the socialite Florence Harriman recalled that in the 1880s, her father returned from England with one of New York's first tennis sets. And so the uh, so we see the hunger and the thirst for tennis and cycling is there. People are starting to appreciate and enjoy these new sports. Uh, by the turn of the century, you start to see enthusiasts involved, people wanting to have bigger, better bikes, um, and you start to see people catch on to tennis, and, um, and eventually you're going to see tennis is going to evolve. I mean, it went from playing on grass to playing on clay to playing on uh, cement, and so and especially with New York, I mean, it has the, the cement courts, and it's very popular uh, with the, the U.S. Open in New York City. Um, but also during that time, um, you also had a lot of new um, refreshments and new uh, snacks that had, that had happened. So um, maybe if after you played a few games of tennis or got through you got uh, bicycling, you might want to get, you know, pick yourself up a, a, some certain snack to munch on. Now, maybe Hershey chocolate bar and Coca-Cola probably aren't the best thing. But again, let's understand something. This is 1900. So. They probably don't understand that sugar is, you know, anyway. So, um, so you wash down your chocolate with your Coca-Cola, um, and Atlanta pharmacist, John Pemberton originally formulated the drink as a cure for headaches in 1886. Um, the thing about John Pemberton is that he was creating all these kind of gags, these gag, um, uh, I guess remedies, um, you know, basically he was like always kind of testing like what, what if i create this little potion or formula of a drink that that can cure your you know your aches and pains or maybe i can create a drink that deals with your headaches and specific things um so he kind of played around with with certain things um to to kind of formulate um these remedies um kind of like you know like five hour energy drink stuff that type of stuff like things you just be like oh, i'll just take this for my headache or whatever that's kind of what he was but what's funny about him is he act how he accidentally come up came up with coca-cola is that he used uh coca leaves which yes you know everybody says well Coca-Cola, real Coca-Cola has cocaine in it. Oh, yeah, no. Basically, the cocoa, the cocaine drug is out of the cocoa leaf as you, you know, it was in the original formula. But anyway, uh, so they just used the leaf. But the leaf and then um, and then it was a, it was originally wine. He used wine and coca uh, leaves. Um, but the problem is he couldn't sell Coca-Cola because – because it was the time of the prohibition and so right around in the in the 1900 into the 19 early 1900s you started seeing prohibition and a lot of places were just not accepting alcohol in their area so <clears throat> people are like whoa 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 you can't sell this it's got wine so he had to go back and retool and so he used the coca leaves he used water and then he used what is called sugar and he kind of mixed it all together and it ultimately created coca-cola and so 
um, that's basically how um, the, that's pretty much how he uh, created uh, I use African cola, cola nuts as well but that's how he kind of created this drink and eventually he thought it was a remedy for headaches but eventually became one of the most popular soft drinks of all time um, so Americans not only participated in new sports but became avid fans of spectator sports like baseball Baseball was a very popular sport from the turn of the 20th century. Um, not only was it a popular sport, but a profitable business. And fans could not, uh, couldn't attend any important boxing match, jammed barbershops and hotel lobbies. To, uh, sorry, uh, who, sorry. So fans who couldn't attend the, the important uh, boxing matches uh, jammed into barbershops and hotel lobbies to listen to telegraph transmissions of certain uh, highlights of, of boxing and baseball. Um, just forgot about boxing to say about that. But boxing was also popular at this time as well. Uh, but baseball really caught on. Um, now, again, wh when did baseball really, you know, become popular? Um, I would argue civil the Civil War really made baseball popular. Um, but apparently new it really started in 1845. New rules transformed uh, baseball um into a professional sport. In 1845, Alexander J. Uh, Cartwright organizes clubs, sets down rules. Um, he kind of creates this in New York. Um, five years later, he had 50 baseball clubs sprung up in the United States and New York alone, boasted 12 clubs in the mid-1860s. Then the Civil War hits, really didn't um, eventually go anywhere. Uh, but the thing is, though, baseball was there, and it was starting to be played by the soldiers um, on the battle uh, when they weren't fighting. And so eventually after the Civil War, it caught back up again in 1869. A team named the Cincinnati Red Stockings toured the country, playing other clubs, trying to prove how good they were. And this ultimately would lead into leagues. Uh, we had the National League in 1876, then the American League in 1900. Uh, then you had the first World Series held in 1903 with the Boston Pilgrims. Because um, remember, um, Plymouth Rock is not far from Boston. So that's where the Pilgrims landed in Massachusetts and the Pittsburgh Pirates. Um, so uh, we do see that African-Americans really wanted to play uh, baseball, but again, segregation around this time. So they had their own league, uh, the Negro National or Negro American Leagues. Um, we see by the 1890s, baseball had published game schedule, official rules, and a standardized uh, diamond. So uh, we are seeing that baseball is growing and becoming the sport um, as we are, as we know it today. It's, be, it's, it's just growing and, and at that time um, and becoming America's pastime. We're seeing increasing numbers of Americans attending school and learning how to read. Um, we're seeing this is helping with the literacy rate jumping. Uh, our galleries are going to jump on this. Libraries, books, and museums are taking up people's interest in learning and, and trying to take up the, the their interest in culture and turning it into entertainment. And so this is also going to help with the mass media, with motion pictures, mass production, the printing techniques, creating thousands of books, magazines, newspapers. Um, you see a lot of mass uh, circulation newspapers. We talked a little bit about this when it came uh, to, uh, you know, I think it was maybe in section one, we talked about the literacy rate jumped by 90% and just newspapers got better, more efficient. And that's what really got people wanting to read. Um, so we see that obviously newspapers were popular and newspapers were about uh, just sensational headlines, stories, big things to capture, you know, like man kills teacher or something or man uh finds gold and things just like just a headlines that attract things even though they were sensational they were maybe not a hundred percent true it's just a and sometimes they were a misleading headline um which you get that a lot um even in today's media it worked and especially the pictures the the big headline there um really helped and what we see is um Joseph Pulitzer, he was a Hungarian immigrant. He comes to New York and he actually gains some money and he takes his money and he buys the New York world in 1883. And he pioneers this whole 
capturing sensational headlines and creates these in, new pioneered innovations, such as large Sundays editions with the comics, the sports, the coverage, and a women's news. So like, you know, the big Sunday paper, which I love to get sometimes, especially um, when I used to read the paper nonstop um, back in the day, it just had everything that you wanted to know about your teams. And uh, my kids love it because of the comics. I'm pretty sure you guys loved it because of the comics. But um, but William Randolph Hearst, who was, had purchased the New York Morning Journal in 1895, he had already owned the San Francisco Examiner. He was wanting to crush Pulitzer. He wanted to outdo him. So there was a bit of a competition. Um, and he exact, But the thing about Hearst is he not only wanted to crush Pulitzer, he, he did it in a way that was a little bit different. He exaggerated the scandals. He was cruel. He was a, um, a hypnotist. Um, or he had tales of cruelty, uh, hematism, sorry, and imaginary conquest of Mars. So you have these outlandish stories um, sometimes. And the escalation and the circulation war drove more and more papers and sensational news coverage. And by 1898, the circulation of each paper, paper reached more than 1 million copies a day. And here's the thing about R William Randolph Hearst, uh, Citizen Kane, Rosebud, that movie uh, by Orson Welles, um, which actually they're making a movie be, because uh, there's another guy who won, I can't remember his name, it's Mark, I think, or Mark. Um, he wrote with Orson Welles and won an Oscar for it. But Citizen Kane, like, had the most, when it came out in the, like, was it 1930s, I think, um, it had the most uh, Oscar nominations um, at that time, but only won one Oscar. And the reason why is because William Randolph Hearst tried to destroy that movie because it, it was based on his life. And, um, and he, he basically went after his own paper saying that I'm not going to publish any paper with a good review of that movie and just really tried to uh, bury that film. But um, it's probably one of the people tend to think it's the most successful film of all time or the greatest film of all time. I mean, to me, it's, it's, it's not a bad film, but to me, I, I, I don't think it's great, but you know, that, that doesn't mean that it's not great. But anyway, by 1900, we start to see art galleries are great, are starting to show more artists work. And one of those is uh, Thomas Aikens, uh, who embraced realism. He wanted to portray life as it is. Um, he studied anatomy, just kind of like those who, um, um, back in the Renaissance, like Michelangelo, who studied anatomy, trying to get the best detail, uh, be exact as best he could. In the early 20th century, uh, Ashkin School of American Art led uh, Atkins student Robert Henry, uh, painted an urban life. Um, and working people with gritty realism and no frills. So try not to fluff things up. And European abstract was also introduced, uh, but that was a little bit difficult to understand. It took a little several more years before people could kind of understand that type of art. Um, Mark Twain is right here, or Samuel Longhorn Clemens, your definition, and uh, West is number 12. By 1900, we start to see uh, more and more libraries are circulating, uh, more books and more reading material with the literacy rates rising in the society. Uh, most people like dime novels, little cheap novels about tales of the wild, wild west. Some wanted more serious things, uh, uh, portrayal of ordinary people, life. Um, you, you had crime novels also, too, um, that were pretty popular. But one novelist was a humorist, Samuel Longhorn Clemens. Uh, he wrote with the pen name Mark Twain, um, rejects high culture, yet writes American classic. And what he does is he he's able to take, you know, really, really uneducated societies like the Deep South and really kind of take those stories and really kind of bring a sense of moralism and education and kind of taking some characters that we may view as dumb, but really highlighting their, their intelligence and their, and, and really just kind of, just kind of bringing a, bring us along a good stringing along a good story, especially with Huckleberry Finn uh, remains famed. It's resounding, uh, ever sorry, rendering of a life of the Mississippi along the Mississippi river. He also wrote Tom. So about Tom Sawyer, that character, and he's had other classics, but, um, it may it probably one of the greatest American writers we've had in our in, in our history. 
Although art galleries and libraries attempted to raise the cultural standards, many Americans had scant interest in high culture and others did not have access to it. And so um, we see that a lot of these activities, as great as they were, um, they were mostly enjoyed by whites. Whites had the more, most of the money and also because of segregation, it kept them, it allowed them to, to enjoy those things. But we see uh, Americans in the turn of the century, uh, we see the development of the department store in modern day shopping. In 1890, the first shopping center opens in Cleveland, Ohio. Glass topped arcade cont uh, contained four levels of jewelry, leather goods, and stationary shops. The arcade also provide uh, uh, band music on Sundays so the Cleveland residents could spend the Sunday afternoon strolling through the elegant environment and gazing the window displays, kind of like a shopping mall in some ways. Uh, retail shopping districts formed uh, where public transportation could easily bring the shoppers, drop them off, and then they can shop in the shopping districts, kind of your outlet. These kind of more your outlet malls, um, I guess you could kind of say. It's until 1865 that Marshall Field comes in, opens up the U.S. department store in Chicago, and stresses personal service. Uh, pioneers bargain basements, selling bargain goods that were less expensive but reliable. Uh, Field's motto was, give the lady what she wants. Make sure that they get what the customer what they want. And so he creates a department store where it has certain levels to it, where you can go to this level to get what you want, this level uh, we'll, we'll give you something different. And so that was kind of the idea of the department store. Uh, we start to see chain stores come out of this um, under some owners for less. We see uh, buying quantity, limit personal service, though. And department stores prided themselves on offering a variety of personal service. Uh, new chain stores like retail stores offering the same merchandise under the same ownership. So goods for less in a quantity and limiting personal service. In 1870, F.W. Woolworth found uh, that if he offered an item at a very low price, the customer would purchase it on the spur of the moment, and it was uh, only a nickel. By 1911, Woolworth chain uh, boasted 596 stores and sold more than a million dollars in goods in a week. So we're starting to see competition here of trying to sell the best goods at the best price and that's what they knew how what works. So we start to see an explosion of advertising. We start to see uh, many different products being advertised, tens of millions of dollars spent in 1865, then $95 million in 1900. So that's a big difference. See patent medicines are grabbing uh, the largest number of advertising lines followed by soaps, baking powders. We see on, pa on trains throughout New York, Philadelphia in the 1870s, you would see signs of Dr. Drake's plantation bitters of, on barns, houses, billboards, and even rocks. So you would see advertising everywhere, and this is blowing up and getting people to go shopping. But also, some people couldn't get to the cities. They couldn't find a way to shop that way. They can't just go, hey, let's go to Chicago and go shop at the department store. No, some of them were in rural towns and small towns, and they didn't have access to those things. So a new form of shopping comes to be, uh, comes to be and that's called catalogs. Montgomery Ward, Richard Sears, uh, catalogs bring good uh, goods to small towns. We see Ward's catalog launched in 1872, grew from a single sheet the first year to a booklet, a thick booklet, um, instruct, uh, ordering instructions in 10 languages. Richard Sears comes along, and the thing about him is that uh, he's a station manager. He he's running um, train stations, the Times, and um, he's going around, and and uh, he somehow gets a hand, a hold of a bunch of pocket watches. And uh, before he took this job as station manager, he um, of running the station, the the railway station, um, he basically was running telegraph. So he knew how to run a telegraph and he thought, man, I got these pocket watches. What am I going to do with these? I know what I can do. I can sell them to conductors because, you know, time zones and people need to keep track of time and when the next train's coming in. So he got on the, the telegram or the telegraph and he started to send a telegram and he basically let them know, hey, I'm selling these pocket watches for such and such price. Who wants one? And then next thing you know, people are, you know, telegramming them back. Yeah, oh, I'd like to get this. And he's, you know, shipping them off. And he starts thinking, huh, I could do this for a living. And so he creates a watch. Uh, he sells watches for a living. That's how he first started off. And then he created, uh, he said, I can expand selling watches, just watches, 
I can create and sell other items to other people. So Richard Sears starts his company called Sears Roebuck and Company. Uh, in 1886, uh, early Sears catalog stated that the companies received hundreds of orders every day from young and old who never before uh, sent away for goods. So we're seeing that people are now able to get a catalog and order what they want. And Sears would grow to be very popular very and ultimately becoming a department store, and just known as Sears, though, uh, dropping the Roebuck and Company. But, uh, you know, now we know what Sears is now. Unfortunately, it's, uh, it's dropping. But I will say this, you know, Montgomery Ward and Richard Sears are ahead of their time because, you know, you look at Amazon, how great Amazon is. Before there was Amazon, there was Sears. There was Montgomery Ward. They were doing the catalog shopping, and that's pretty much what it was. By 1910, about 10 million, of, which is the number 14, Americans shocked by mail. United States Post Office boosted mail order business, which created rule-free delivery RFD. Uh, post office delivers direct to every home, creating a big change in American lives. And this is huge because now the average American who lives in a small town can finally buy what they want thanks to the catalog. So, uh, but, you know, we're seeing America change. We're seeing America grow and business is growing as well. All right, that's going to do it for chapter eight. We're done.